Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Threat Talk. I'm your host, Bob Hansman, and today we're continuing our series with Josh Quo and Ross Gibson, the authors of a new security book titled The Hidden Potential of DNS in Security. Now, for this episode, I wanted to drill into one of the five areas of DNS abuse that is outlined in the book that they call redirection and misdirection. So, Josh, uh, Ross, thank you for being with us again. Thank you. Glad to be back. Well, uh, as I mentioned, I'm gonna, I want to really get into some more of these uh, five areas of abuse that you called out in the book. And it's particularly today, I'd like to focus on the redirection and misdirection. And I'm dedicating this episode because this is really a big deal today. Um, I mean, it's also used for legitimate purposes, which unfortunately is a lot of the problems we have with security. Things that are created to make the internet work better, to make email better, to make our, just the applications uh, more capable all this stuff created for good can be twisted by the bad guys. So how do the bad guys apply redirection and misdirection in our modern cyber attacks? And let's uh, today, let's start with you, Ross. Sure. So, um, you know, there's a bunch of different ways they can do it. A, a lot of them have to start out with evasion, right? And that can be things like uh, what we, what are commonly known as lookalike domains, right? So they, they're domains that, look very close to or maybe a common misspelling of an existing domain um, and you can go back to kind of where it all started i know it's one of josh's favorites is uh paypi right so which is kind of the first major one where they took paypal and changed the l to an i and did an uppercase i and so it looks basically just like paypal.com and then obviously redirect you know sending people to a place other than where they think they're going. It's not really that we're rerouting them. It's that we've tricked them into thinking that this one place is the exact same as some other place that they would normally legitimately go. Yeah. And that kind of goes with that. Uh, uh, in the abstract, I kind of use this magician theme where, you know, that's the key behind all magic is to misdirect and redirect you that, you know, when I say, okay, now watch me pull this thing out of my hand, they're actually doing something with their other hand out off camera and you don't see it. And so they're, they're using these techniques to make you think and focus on something and you miss the obvious clues that are there because you're not expecting them. Um, I even remember uh, some studies that I had to take in well, university, you know, you have to take classes that have nothing to do with your major just because you're getting a well-rounded education. And one of the classes I had was where they would show you stuff and they say, and then they take it away and say, okay, so how many words were misspelled? And it's like, what? I, they all looked right to me because our mind fills in the gaps. And the example you gave of PayPal versus PayPal is a, is a great example. Um, and how often do you see that, uh, Josh? How, how often are we seeing that kind of technique? Uh, we're still seeing it today. So PayPal and PayPal, that was 20 years ago, more than 20, oh. the year 2000, right? This is even <laughs> before the term phishing was invented. Um, and it's such an effective technique that it lives to today. In fact, if you do some thread research today on the name PayPal, there's still a lot of those. They still use different variations and spellings. And what opened up a new door for these attackers is about 10 years ago, um, the DNS community green light the use of international characters. So the, with good intention. They were hoping, well, you can, you can register a domain name in Korean. You can register one in Arabic. Well, it turns out there's a bunch of Greek and Latin and other characters that overlap with the English character, like the Omicron character in Greek. It's a different character, but visually it looks exactly like, oh, so as an attacker, I could potentially go out and register Google, but replace both O's with the Greek Omicron letters. And it looks visually just like Google, but you wouldn't know. You click on it, it takes me to a site that looks like Google. How would I know the difference? Right. So yeah. that is still going very strong for a lot of these attackers as sort of the first uh, breach in the uh, attack life cycle of luring people in. They'll click on something, get infected with malware. Yeah, I remember when uh, that came out, uh, those kinds of attacks were becoming more popular. And I remember learning about Punicode so that um, I could actually get a visual uh, indicator that 
um, this is a bad um, domain or a malicious domain. And when I started looking at all the different languages in Unicode, um, they're not all the popular ones. I didn't, there's a Cherokee character set, you know, and I was thinking, well, I, I know that there's a Cherokee language and, and I assumed there was some sort of a written language, but the fact that, you know, that is in there, um, that just gives you an idea of just how many different kinds of languages are, are in the whole Unicode set. Um, and when I did uh, that study, I took the word, the name Infoblox for infoblox.com. And uh, there was an on-site uh, or an, on the internet website where you could put in something and then it would do the auto substitutions for everything that might look like it. And they came up with 1.2 million variations of just the name infoblox.com. There are now a lot of them, to be quite frank, I'm looking, I'm saying, okay, that's not an O, <laughs> you know, but um, that just starting with that list, I'm sure I could come up with a few hundred that look exactly like what most people would expect. It, it's, it's nasty, but now we also have, they not only added the Unicode, they've also added new TLDs like dot zip. That was something that's been a big issue this year where um, they're not just imitating fake websites, but they put the link inside your email and they make it look like a file name. But when you click on it, you end up going to a domain that is a dot zip domain. Yep. And, th and that plays into the hidden path thing that we were talking about earlier, right? Because you can actually use those slash characters in, in the labels after the host name to make it look like it's an actual file path. And those, and those new TLDs, .zip in particular, really make that difficult for people to pick out because they're used to seeing zip files, right? Mm -hmm. They've been around forever. Well, and I also wanted to uh, make sure um, that we highlight that while that's the exciting and the cool thing, and there are definitely those attacks that do it because people are, you know, they're getting a little more leery. Um, I remember... Um, when I got into computers, uh, we still had VCRs and the average user could not even figure out how to program the time on their VCR. The technology capabilities of your average user was pretty low. But today, everybody with their smart devices and stuff, they really take pride in knowing technology. Everybody really wants to be on top. So they've gotten pretty good at mousing over links and things like that, those basic steps. And that is why the bad guys are doing these kinds of character substitutions. But another technique that they've been using, uh, particularly since puny code and other measures have come out, is I noticed that they won't take, uh, you know, Amazon.com or PayPal.com. They'll go register a site called PayPal-discount-services.bonus.com. I mean, they'll just string words together that in the context of their socially engineered email, it's a perfectly legitimate looking name, but, uh, and it's got Amazon. I mean, wouldn't Amazon own every name that had the word Amazon in it? Um, you would think so until you start realizing, hold it. There's a whole bunch of businesses along this place called the Amazon in Brazil that have the words Amazon in their name and they have domain names. And so, um, you know, you really can't count on the name being legitimate. So, I, that's a long way of building up. So how do I counter all of this? So this, take that yeah. <laughs> so, so obviously, right, I think we've laid the groundwork that this is a human, you know, impossible for human beings, you know, at least one or two individuals to keep up. Uh, a lot of visual tricks, a lot of domain name variations. Uh, like you mentioned, we have new top-level domain names now, uh, .zip, .pizza, .data, .whatever. It's impossible uh, for any security person to keep on top of, is this a legitimate domain name? And that's why you know the, the threat research and threat intel uh, research now includes uh, DNS domain name, uh, usually for reputation as part of the security consideration. So when you're doing a security policy, you should you know, be able to subscribe or purchase some sort of uh, intelligence data that includes the DNS domain name reputation so that you know, hey, I'm trying to go to uh, paypal.amazon.com. Well, is that a real domain name or is that a, you know, is the O slightly switched out to a, a Omicron O or is the, uh, is the W spelled with two Vs? 
you don't have to worry about it, right? You have literally teams of people that spend their days researching this and publishing that information uh, that you can then take advantage of. Yeah, and, and you have vendors that even specialize more distinctly than that, right? So you've got threat intelligence vendors that focus on just newly registered domains, right? Because it's been proven that most newly registered domains are used for malicious purposes at some point, right? So by blocking them for the first, you know, 72 hours, mm -hmm. while you give the security industry time to do its research and actually classify these things out, you can, you know, cut out a bunch of potential threats early, um, you know, and get that from somebody like Farsight Security who, who specializes in newly observed domains, and then there are others. Um, but I, I think having a group of threat intelligence sources that you can trust and then using the tools within DNS to take advantage of that threat intelligence, which is typically known as RPZ or response policy zone, that's a really critical tool in starting to be able to combat all of these kind of threats, whether they be lookalikes or just straight malicious domains that are out there and registered. Uh, it could be all kinds of different things, but having that threat intelligence and having a way to put that in place on your DNS platform uh, is a tremendous advantage for a security team. Now, about 25 years ago, and I'm pulling that date from my own history because I was actually the product manager that launched one of the very first web filters at the time. This is the kind of thing that they did, but they had to get URLs. I mean, it was designed for full URLs and domains. Um, and now we have, you know, next gen firewall, which means that it's a firewall that also has a web filter in it. Maybe a few other things. It's, uh, they used to be called UTM, but that became a negative term in the industry. So they call it next gen firewall. Let's, let's give it a new name. And now it sounds really cool. Um, and they are cool. I don't know why UTM got, a, got a bad rap, but, um, Web filtering is one of the first things I think people would turn to for this kind of capability, but you're talking about doing it at a DNS layer rather than at a web filtering layer. Um, so I will call out that the benefit of a web filter is that most of them now also have a, a scanner, so they'll look at the malware. But like we talked about in our, in our first episode, this is about the communications. You know, the malware could easily be missed. And again, to our listeners, go back and listen to the first of the series to understand some of the limitations there. But there's so many communications going on. How is DNS superior at helping with this problem versus something like a, an old-fashioned web filter? Um, oh, go ahead, Ross. Um, so one of the ways is just how early it is in the chain, right? At the, at the end of the day, the web filter is going to be busy, right? It's going to be scanning all kinds of traffic. But if, if we know that the domain itself is malicious, right? If we already know that it's a bad destination, why send them there and then do the analysis? At the end of the day, the end result is the same. Let's get the traffic off at the earliest possible point that we can. And also use that to detect who is trying to go there. And then, you, you know, your incident response teams can take advantage of that to actually go and try and remediate a potentially infected host. So, I, and I think it's, you know, like you said, you've got next gen firewalls that are catching all kinds of different things and they're great tools and web filters are great tools and secure email gateways are great tools. But, you know, as each of those protocols, right, when HTTP was kind of the number one protocol that everybody abused, then they built tools around that and then it became more secure and then they shifted to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And now we're at a point where DNS is one of those that just like you have a secure web gateway, you've got a secure email gateway, you need a secure DNS gateway. Yeah. And uh, I know with DNS in particular, you know, they've now the next gen firewalls are actually saying, Hey, now with DNS security, uh, again, that's a bad name that we talked about in the first episode as well, but they're adding DNS security there, but because they're now taking the traffic out of the DNS protocol, they're losing things like device identity and information and stuff like that. Um, so doing it within the DNS architecture at the DNS call, if I'm catching you correct, number one, before it, it would ever go through a web filter, the DNS request is saying, hey, I want to go to this place and we're going to come back and say no. In which case, the, the, the HTTP call out never happens. The web filter never mm -hmm. becomes involved. It never has anything to scan. And that can reduce a lot of load, I assume, on those kinds of devices. They don't have to do any scanning. Uh, they, they're, I mean, 
if you can catch, I think the stats from the NSA was like 90%, 92%. Yeah, 92% of all malware uses DNS. So if I can block 92% of it at the DNS layer, then the 8% that would go through my web filter, all of a sudden I need lower capacity, which if I'm doing appliances, I know companies that have got like five or six of those things racked and load balanced. They might be down to two. And if I'm paying for a cloud service, my traffic goes down. That also saves me a lot of money. So um, that was the first thing my money uh, or my mind went to was the money when you started talking about catching it earlier and shifting it left. Um, and then I think also in the first episode, Ross, you were talking about how they can get, you know, they use some of this stuff for evasion. Um, and we can bypass some evasion techniques that might not get caught at, uh, at a web filter level. Would that be correct? Yeah, well, that's, that's true because, you know, especially in the web world, you've got so many different domain names that are going on just behind a single web page, right? You might have just one link out of hundreds that are in a web in a single web page that are malicious. And if you're scanning or you're classifying based upon the main domain name target that they're going to, you might miss that little, you know, like you were referring to before, really small piece of code, right? Just the one little downloader that's just going to go and start pulling updates and pulling other stuff. So the, catching every bit of traffic that's going out there is a real advantage that DNS has because it's really going to see every little bit as it's going through. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm actually, the way you worded that triggered something that I remember also from about 22 years ago. I think it was Trend Micro introduced a feature with their, uh, their email security where they knew that the bad guys would register a site. And you mentioned about newly observed domains. You know, those are something to keep an eye on. Well, they weren't doing that, but they would notice that the guys would create the do domain. They'd put the link in the email that's going to go to the bad place, and then they'd send the emails overnight. And they'd come in through whoever's email system. They'd look at the domain names and check the URLs with their web filter or whatever, and everything looks kosher because the site doesn't exist yet. And then about mm -hmm. 8 o'clock in the morning as everybody's coming into work, they start they turn on that server and that domain becomes active. And before anybody can react, people in the morning, they're all clicking on their morning emails, checking this, checking that. And the next thing you know, they're all infected because they time when this stuff goes lively. But they're, again, that's because they're focused on the content on the site. Whereas with DNS, you're talking about just, no, the characteristics of the site make it, um, in this case, it, we're not even talking look like this would just be like a suspicious site, right? Suspicious. Yeah. Right. Now you yeah. guys have been working with the suspicious stuff. How does that come into play here? Um, so, so, uh, suspicious would be a category where we th we're pretty sure we have a certain level of confidence that this is going to, this is going to be used for bad, uh, to do bad things. We just don't have any proofs yet. Um, but how do we know it's going to do bad things? Well, one of them is a is clear giveaway in the name itself. Nobody in the right normal person will register a bunch of random characters. So that's 32 characters long at the domain name that nobody can even pronounce. Yeah. Why? Because the whole point of DNS is I want people to know my name. Josh is awesome.com and go there and go order yeah, some I've books been to or that something. Site before. That's a great <laughs> site, by the way. Yes. Right. But no one's going to go to just like, you know, something that's completely random character. So if you have a domain name that's been registered, say, today, and it's completely random, not humanly readable, it, chances are this is not registered for to do something good. Uh, we don't have any proofs yet. So we're going to we can file it under suspicious that we are pretty sure within the next few days it will start. Like you said, they're waiting. The attackers are waiting to turn it on to start doing something bad now they are be, waiting longer and longer what would be um, some of the indicators that would let you know that early on that something's suspicious so one would be the tld that they use right so there are some tlds that are kind of notorious for being used maliciously like dot xyz or something like that um and and by taking that as a characteristic, right? And then taking the other characteristic, like Josh said, of it's not normal, you know, words. And you can look at a few different factors. 
to help kind of guide you down and say, there's something about this that implies that, you know, we expect to see some type of nefarious activity coming from this domain. And that that's where you would kind of say suspicious. And then you move from suspicious to, to straight malicious. Once you actually start seeing activity going on and you say, okay, you know, they're, they're pushing malware from this site. That's definitely malicious. And you would put it in a, into a malicious category instead. Well, and when I think of DNS, I'm also thinking of, you know, now you're looking at registrar information and who is information. So, um, I mean, and, and we, I don't think we've gone into it a lot of detail, but I've had some other episodes with uh, some threat Intel people and they talk about how the bad guys will go out and they'll actually register a couple of dozen sites as part of an infrastructure because it's no longer just here's a link to the place where you get the malware. It's a link to the malware. And then, oh, they also link back to a place where they deliver certain pen test tools and they deliver, they go to a different C2 server for other kinds of content. Mm -hmm. These are huge infrastructures. And when they need to update or expand their infrastructure, they're going to register a whole bunch of sites all at once. And that would probably, I imagine, raise some flags. Again, you're looking at the DNS level, not the URL level, like a web filter. And that would give you some visibility into those activities that make the flag start going up, you know, a bright yellow flag, even if it's not red. Right. 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 Well, that, that plus you have, you know, with the emergence of the cloud, you've got more and more sites being hosted within quote unquote legitimate address space. Right. And because from a traditional firewall perspective, if you're blocking based on IP addresses, if you block a given IP address that's in a range used by AWS, for example, you could be blocking a ton of legitimate services mm. inadvertently. So that's where, you know, doing it on the DNS rather than doing it just based on the IP that you're resolving to is where you can get a little bit more surgical about what you're actually trying to block against rather than being a little bit more heavy handed and, and ending up, you know, potentially mm -hmm. causing business dis disruption. Well, yeah, I do actually recall a situation where a um, couple of newspapers in Italy uh, were being compromised. It was a waterhole attack, so people were putting malware on their site. And so the immediate reaction of a lot of security tools was, well, let's block this IP address. And it happened to be a hosting site that hosted hundreds of local newspapers across Italy. And all of a sudden, nobody in Italy could get their news. Um, so, uh, real overkill. I even remember a policy one time, a company put out them for their email and it had a typo and they basically said, let's block all emails where the subject line contains the letter P. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> those, those are prime examples of, of overkill where the policy worked. There was actually not a single attack that could get through that, but a lot of legitimate stuff couldn't get through it too. So, um, your comment about surgery or surgical uh, attacks becomes uh, much more uh, uh, important under those kinds of scenarios. So where are we seeing um, overall, where are we seeing uh, misdirection and redirection? Is there any particular industry that, uh, I mean, is it just consumers with PayPal and all that, or are there certain industries that are being targeted? Um, I think it's, it's really across the board. Um, I wouldn't say it's being targeted. It's a tool. The uh, I, I, malicious actors are going to gravitate towards what is effective. Um, and this, so far, is still, unfortunately, still effective because not a lot of people have this capability uh, in their organization to detect uh, you know, uh, uh, suspicious or malicious uh, DNS names. A lot of people are still kind of in the block by IP address, or I'm going to block a few uh, well-known bad domain names. So until we, as a, as a, I think, as an internet community, move to the point where DNS is no longer a very effective and cheap way to exploit, to attack, then the attackers will continue to use these uh, techniques doesn't matter it's hosp hospitals or uh, state governments or or education uh, it's whatever works for them yeah now what I've seen though is um, and like you said you know I want to make sure that, you know there was no particular vertical market because I've seen some examples um, like in uh, banking and investments insurance uh, some in healthcare a lot in government 
Um, and recently, um, you know, recently, I mean, how long has the, the, the war in Ukraine been going on? A lot of supply chain target attacks. So it's no longer the PayPal's and the Amazon's, but these guys are using these techniques to target somebody that is maybe not as well known by the general public, but they are key um, to the functions of, of other services. Um, and so I think one of the best examples I saw was where somebody or stories I, I heard was when somebody said, so this example I just gave you, it, think back to when Target was breached because of a configuration error by their HVAC vendor who had you know, access on their network. Um, you know, this, the, the whole, uh, I mean, we've had so many of these breaches where it was somebody you may have never heard about before, but because of a vulnerability there, um, people got onto the network and the bad guys are now using the techniques you've been talking about this misdirection and redirection where they say, Hey, why don't we just pretend to be them, send in emails and have people click on a link thinking that, you know, um, I can get there. Oh, and I just had a me memory. I lived in Chicago for a while. A company there went out of business. They were, they were, they knew they were going to be closing, but they, they had like eight months to clean up because of some government regulation. So they sent a notification and laid off like two thirds of their, their whole staff. And then everybody in the company got an email that said, Hey, as you know, we've had to cut things back and this is infecting you, but you know, you've been such a good employee. We want to do really good things for you. We want to treat you right. So here's a link to a third party service that we are using to help you find new employment. Um, and if you register in the next 24 hours, we'll be able to get you six months bonus pay. You will get your insurance for a year for all of your family. I mean, it was a huge bonus package, but you need to go to this third party and register. So they didn't even use the brand, but they had impersonated the company's HR to send this out and all the links look legitimate. So between the supply chain acts and all that, this is no longer PayPal. This is, and that's where I used the term targeted um, uh, earlier. They are getting so specific. They don't care if they're going to hit the whole world. They're just hoping to hit maybe a particular industry in two or three States or in one country. Right. I mean, what are you guys seeing on that line? Um, I, I, yeah, I just throw in the real quick one. The one that you mentioned reminds me of an example we had in the book. Uh, it's for a BEC, for business email compromise, right? A lot of, we've been talking about DNS in the context, almost like in, you know, almost as part of web traffic. Um, but people often forget email is still a big thing. And then email also relies on DNS. So we have an example in the book where the attacker used, again, lookalike domain, add an S to the end of their business name and I won't you know, go through all the details. You can go get the book and read about it. Um, basically, I'm in the middle. So I am in inserted myself between the company and the venture capitalist to say, give me more money to invest. And in the end, the uh, scammer walked away with over a million dollars uh, just by changing a few DNS names in between. Uh, Ross, any stories that uh, you like to share? <laughs> Oh, I, I, I love the one that Josh talked about. It's, it's, um, but I, I think when you get into the supply chain, I think kind of the poster child, unfortunately for that would be solar winds, right? I mean, that's probably the, the biggest one that really brought the supply chain attack kind of to the forefront. Yeah. And, and, and I'm glad again, you reminded everybody that, you know, these are, the, this is the kind of information that's in this book and, you know, while there's so many books about DNS from a networking perspective, this has become my go-to reference for anything security related in DNS, which is great for when I'm doing investigations, threat hunting, and there's aspects of DNS that I haven't looked at that for a while and I need to be reminded. So it's not just uh, something to go through and learn. Um, you know, it's, it's also something I just keep handy uh, when I need to grab it. And uh, unfortunately, we are really coming up to our time here. So I'm going to have to cut this short for today's episode. Remind the audience that this is the second of a three-part series. So there will be another one. If you haven't heard the first, go back. And if you haven't uh, had a chance to uh, take a look at the book, you can get it um, on Amazon.com. Uh, the book is titled The Hidden Potential of DNS Insecurity. And... Um, 
Let's see. Oh, and now we'll uh, have it as we post the podcast on the Infoblox website. There will be links there. There should be links in uh, a lot of your uh, podcast sites. So we're going to make sure you have all the links to uh, to their book. But Josh, uh, Josh Roth, thank you very much for coming on today. Thanks thank a lot. Bob. And I want to thank all of our viewers and listeners for your time as well. Join us next time as we continue our efforts to help you stay on top of cybersecurity and ahead of cyber risks on Threat Talk.